case of Collie McCraney allegedly killing two teenage girls is a case so tortuous, even the best of investigators remained clueless for two decades. This case, still unsolved to this date, makes us wonder, what really happened? Lost evidence with crucial DNA of the murderer, silenced witnesses, the media misleading the public, the police taking six hours to open the trunk of the girl's car. All of these mysteries are going to be unraveled within this video, as 10 things don't add up in the J.B. Beasley and Tracy Howlett case. Last August, police gave the case another look, sending DNA evidence to a lab to try and find a match in a genealogy database. Those results led them to McCraney. In 2019, 49-year-old Collie McCraney was convicted for the 1999 murder of two 17-year-olds on Herring Avenue in Ozark, Alabama. The truck driver got a life sentence without parole, while the families of the two victims, J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett, never got full closure and we're left with many questions unanswered. Year without any answers. Uh, <laughs> another year that we're, you know, still trying to find answers. If you aren't familiar with this story and haven't watched the first video where we dive into the case itself, we highly recommend you do so before watching this video. It is linked in the description below. On a Saturday evening of July 31st, 1999, the murder of two 17-year-olds, J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett, on Herring Avenue, Ozark in Alabama, United States, shocked an entire city. The two high school senior girls were all glammed up and about to be on their way to celebrate JB's birthday, held in her honor in Headland. They took JB's 1993 black Mazda 929 and headed out at 10.05 p.m. They never made it to the party. Instead, they were found dead in the trunk of their car the following morning. JB Hilton Green Beasley was born in 1981 to the family of Lanier Beasley and Cheryl Burgoon, and met Tracy Hallett, her best friend, in school, where they became inseparable. They did everything together, and unfortunately, left the world together way too early as well. Looking at the teenagers' tragic deaths, some things didn't add up during the investigation and left many questions unanswered. We've compiled the most important ones for you. After the first crime report came in at 12 a.m., the officers finally found their way to the crime scene on Herring Avenue at 9 a.m. on the 1st of August, 1999. They tried extremely hard to understand what happened at the crime scene. Without gloves, they went around searching the inside of the car to solve the puzzle in front of them. They took hours before deciding to look in the trunk where the girls' dead bodies had been exposed to the heat. It was at that time that one of them saw blood leak from the trunk of the car and realized there's a latch at the driver's seat that pops open the trunk. A common feature in many cars, but it took these officers six hours to piece together. After proving their incompetence with the car trunk, the officers proved it once again shortly after when it came to DNA testing. When the DNA that was found on Beasley's clothing did not match the suspect Collie McCraney, he was excluded as a suspect. They assumed the DNA taken from semen found on J.B. Beasley's clothing, a sweater and underwear, was that of the murderer. But the case against Collie McCraney, with the pathologist performing the autopsy claiming no signs of sexual assault, makes you think, what if it's not? Conveniently, the shirt with the evidence of McCraney allegedly murdering the girls has been lost and was never seen again. After losing their way to Headland, the girls refilled their gas at the Big Little Store station, where JB used a nearby payphone to call her mother, filling her in on their whereabouts at 11.30 p.m. and stating that they were coming home. They left the gas station with a full tank and some company, according to the surveillance camera, but nobody ever thought their tank would be found empty 40 minutes after their departure. The 1993 Mazda 929 had an average fuel efficiency of around 18 to 23 miles per gallon on highways, and 14 to 18 miles per gallon in city driving conditions. To estimate the number of hours the car can drive, we need to consider the average speed you plan to drive at. Let's assume a cruising speed of 60 miles per hour, which is a common speed on highways. So with the assumptions made, the 1993 Mazda 929 with a full tank could potentially drive approximately 253.5 miles on the highway at a speed of 60 miles per hour. So did their company take them on a road trip? Probably not. 
The police also claimed the car key was missing too, and that they found JB's driver's license on the dashboard. Hmm, did they get into a police check on the road? Why else would her license be on the dashboard? Who has the key? And why did the police claim the car was found with an empty tank? Did someone tamper with it to stop the girls from driving away? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. When the trunk was opened and their bodies were discovered after being trapped for six hours, the police stated that their pants were soiled from the waist down, while the girls' clothes were covered in mud and dirt, including their faces. Traces of unknown semen were found on their panties and skin. Surprisingly, there was no evidence of forced sexual activity or alcohol influence found during the autopsy. This leads to the question, where did the DNA come from? There's no record of J.B. Beasley having an affair with an older individual or even a known boyfriend, so the possibility of her being involved with someone else is ruled out. J.B. Beasley's last call to her mother from the payphone was at 11.30 p.m., while the first report call came in at 12.30 a.m., an hour later. Considering the average time for sexual intercourse, we're left wondering how long the conversation took, how they got muddy, and why no DNA was found on JB's shirt right when the girls were discovered, but only later when no suspect was in the picture. Could they have been involved in a fight? Were they dragged through the dirt after being assaulted? Unfortunately, we couldn't find any information on this matter and remain clueless at this point. Regarding the traces of human DNA found on JB's shirt, there are several theories to consider. In Alabama, there were several notable fertility clinics and reproductive centers operating in 1999. Some well-known fertility clinics during that time included the Art Fertility Program of Alabama and Alabama Fertility Specialists, both located in Birmingham, as well as the University of Alabama at Birmingham, UAB, Fertility Clinic, and the Fertility Institute of North Alabama, based in Huntsville. So here's the connection. Sperm donation programs. Is it possible that McCraney could have been a donor at any of these facilities? Collie Lewis McCraney, a 49-year-old native of Alabama, graduated from Carroll High School in Ozark in 1992. He was an athlete and also served as the president of the library club. McCraney joined the U.S. Air Force from 1993 to 1997. He got married in 1992, but separated in 1994 before eventually divorcing. At the time of the murder, he was 26 years old and living on Lizenby Drive in Ozark, just one mile from the crime scene. On March 19, 2019, he was arrested in Daleville, Alabama, where he claimed to have no knowledge of any of the girls. The fact that McCraney, a trucker, divorcee, former Air Force officer, and now preacher, with no identifiable criminal history, could be the perpetrator of the murder presents a challenge to David Emery, the prosecutor. Could McCraney really be the culprit? Taking into account his past, his wife once appeared at the gate of Keesler Air Force Base at 3.37 a.m. on April 11, 1994, to report an assault committed by McCraney. She had bruises on her left cheek and a spot on her hair, indicating a forceful pull-off by the same preacher. Rena Crum was a sworn Ozark Auxiliary Police Officer who was a witness to the July 31st, 1999 murder of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett. She, however, surfaced in 2015 after saying she could no longer keep silent, calling out an Ozark officer for the killing. She mentioned Gary Butch Whittington, Rex Tipton, and Eddie Henderson, all present the night of the incident. She further stated that the officer alongside his cohorts pulled the girls over asking them for the particular whereabouts of some cassette tape. The tape contains recorded conversations of a pilot and the accused officer at the Ozark airport, where Rena later stated they were unloading hard drugs, as confirmed by the narcotics officer, Dean Matthews. According to Rena, one of the victims knew the pilot, and that spelt doom for the officers in question. The tape would be presented in court as evidence for an ongoing proceeding August 2nd, 1999, two days after the girls were murdered. Shortly after Rena's outburst, she started getting threats from multiple law enforcement officers who were aware of the killer's identity and got rid of the evidence. Rena also stated that the police chief who handled the original investigation, Tony Spivy, also shielded the truth. Not long after, a known journalist, John B. Carroll, 
who understood Rena's silence on the case, stated that Rena was severely brutalized with a baseball bat after coming forward, and that deterred her from naming the actual killer. Gary, Rex, Eddie, and Tony all denied their involvement. On January 29th, 2016, Keith Coffin, Rex Tipton, Tony Spivy, Eddie Henderson, and Gary Whittington filed a lawsuit against Rena Crum, John B. Carroll, the journalist, and Dean Matthews, the narcotics officer, on charges of reliable slander, defamation of character, and so on. However, the lawsuit ended up in the drawers. In May 2016, Reyna was suspended and fined $250 after being convicted of harassing J.B. Beasley's sister. Allegedly, there was one major accomplice and one minor accomplice. On September 1st, 1999, a man named Johnny William Barentine appeared at the police department in a bid to shed some light on the dying case. He, however, gave multiple non-correlating accounts of the incident under the four hours of questioning before giving in. He claimed he was at the Big Little store to get some milk for his kid before returning home at 1 a.m. Upon verification, he doesn't live far from the scene of the murder, making him a prime suspect at that time. The case was considered solved until they took into consideration the semen factor that was absent from all of his accounts. He was released on the 17th of December, 1999, after his DNA wasn't a match. There was another suspect from Mississippi and two others from Michigan, Investigations met a dead end for the two of them. Consequently, they were released. The county DNA facility also tested hundreds of people, but had no luck finding a match. As of the time of the incident, the casing found on Beasley's leg was that of a 9mm handgun, which was the only gun involved, until the emergence of the Dauphin Eagle account, revealing two separate pistols by the forensics department. This could mean two individuals did it, or one person with two guns, which isn't likely. According to known facts that the girls had filled up at the Big Little convenience store, Beasley's mother confirmed a call from her daughter at 11.30 p.m. According to the researcher journalist John B. Carroll, he had been able to obtain the girls' last call home. However, there was a second call made at 11.46 p.m., either to a pager or to the number whose account the calling card used is billed to. Upon reaching out to experts, the number was confirmed to be a pager. The FBI could have researched to determine who was called, but they chose not to pursue the information. According to Carroll, the other issue is from what he understood to be the phone records of the Headland Sitco payphone. The payphone records of the baseball field where they were potentially last seen, and a call reported by Wade Williams. Tracy's friend, to his home, who he believes was Tracy, just before 2 a.m., are missing from the police department's records. No one in the law enforcement community has any idea how this could have happened. If you remember Johnny William Barentine, you'll remember the account he gave at the Ozark Police Department that he was present when the girls were murdered and witnessed the murders by a white man with tattoos on his body. Barentine, like the other suspect, then left town. Both knew details of the crime scene that could not have been known otherwise unless they were there. Both feared for their safety. Another already neglected witness gives a key explanation that he met Tracy Hollett at a party on Highway 36 just minutes from the store just after 11 p.m. Strangely, he gives an exact description of her clothing that could not possibly have been known. Just as the witness was confused about two parties on Highway 36, the police were as well and interviewed witnesses from the wrong Highway 36 party. Their notes indicate they went to the party the witness was trying to go to, not the one where he met Tracy. Who facilitated the party? Another pointer is the mail sent to the Alabama Bureau of Investigations nine days after the bodies were discovered from an individual linked to a racial extremist group. The journalist, John B. Carroll, was able to locate this individual and interview him. This individual believes white women who associate physically with black men should be killed. This man belongs to the Klan, an extremist group, one of which is in Dale County. He feels the Klan is too liberal on issues of race. Disturbingly, he was close to J.B. Beasley, and she spent a lot of time with him. John B. Carroll said the FBI interviewed the individual multiple times, 
and had him do a polygraph test. The individual denied any role in the murders, but spoke about Beasley having a troubled, complicated life before her murder. However, defense attorneys do not have access to emails, investigator memos, or ABI and FBI interview transcripts. In light of the refusal by the prosecutor to follow the rules regarding discovery, another question is what was turned over to the state's cold case unit? Were they given the entire case files, specifically those identifying leads crucial for McCraney's defense? In reality, they were not. When the district attorney's office turns over the discovery files to comply with the judge's order, a harder question arises. Did they have the files that were originally denied or reported lost in the attorney general's cold case unit in their possession? If not, where are they? That is the question the custodian for the department should be asked under oath says Carol. Many of the local media, WTVY, WDHN, and the Dothan Eagle, local newspaper, headlines are questionable and often pro-prosecution. They once reported the defense ready for trial, publishing wrong information, such as that Beasley's body was found after two days. Here are the department's records showing the date and time the girls were reported missing and when they were found. These directly contradict the Dothan Eagle's reporting. Is this just sloppy journalism or an attempt to mislead the public? Let us know what you think. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out our channel for more thrilling stories, such as the infamous Menendez Brothers case that Netflix made into their next hit series, or the chilling case of Beth Thomas, the child of rage.